The following announcement has been paid for by the New Wealth Manager Advisory Club. Hey everybody, it's the president of the Wealth Manager Advisory Club, Jack Mitchell, here once again to welcome you to another exciting WMA Club meeting. In fact, this is our first bonus meeting of the 2023 spring semester. So, again, this is something we're trying out this semester to see if you guys actually like the meetings on Tuesdays and not on Thursdays. So, again, this is only be for the semester. We're going to see how it plays out. Um, but two things before I send you guys off to Future Jack to have you guys watch our awesome meeting we have today with Elaine M. King from Family and Money Matters. First of all, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who supported, who actually um, was there, watched our live stream, watched the video, watched our first meeting. Within one day of upload, um, we hit third, 20 views, which is the most amount we've ever hit within a single day of recording. And currently, as of right now, as of this recording, um, it's actually 31 views, which is our second most uh, popular meeting we've ever had. Actually, the first one being Peter Lento back last year. If anyone wants to watch that meeting, you guys can actually go to our um, YouTube channel and go to our playlist and watch all those great meetings we had last year. So again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for supporting us. Um, and again, we are not stopping there. We have a lot more speakers coming in this semester and we're so excited to kick it off like we had kicked off um last week with gloria so you guys already probably know this already um actually two things before i could go on further one where am i actually well first of all i'm actually in the bloomberg lab here on our forum campus on the monitor center at metro campus is actually at dickinson hall please use these facilities guys these are awesome machines you're able to look up bloomberg actually get bloomberg certified Throw that plug in there. And also, just to throw a quick plug, Smeef meets every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. in the Bloomberg Lab. And Markets Update featuring FDU alumni, John Budish, Rich Brenner, every Tuesday from 3 to 4 p.m. in the Bloomberg Labs and on Zoom. Just want to throw that quick plug out there for them because we do support Smeef. So, you guys probably know already that we do have corporate sponsors, and we want to feature them now throughout the entire semester. So, you know, not every single meeting, but in some meetings, you will hear me talk about one of our great sponsors that we have with this club. And today's sponsor for this video is Metricool. Now, you guys are probably wondering, well, how are we able to send you guys all of those great social media content we have? Well, we actually have to thank Metricool for that. So basically, Metricool is the ultimate social media analysis tool. Metricool provides you with a powerful set of analysis tools that will help you track, measure, and analyze your performance on social media. You can track how your posts are performing, get insights into your followers' demographics, and measure your overall engagement. Metricool also provides powerful scheduling and public publication tools so it's easy to plan, schedule, and post content on multiple social media platforms like LinkedIn, TikTok, your website, obviously, which is our website, fdwma.wixsite.com, if anyone wants to go view that. Um, right off the top of my head, Twitter, even tick, even Instagram with just a few clicks. And that's not all. Metricool offers detailed reports and insights into your social media performance so you can easily identify trends and optimize your strategy. So what are you waiting for? Try Metricool today and take your social media presence to the next level by clicking the link in our link tree, which is down in the description below. And obviously you guys go to our website and click the link in our sponsors page to get brought to Metricool's website. Actually get the account for free. Yeah, I'm not lying. An account for free. Not like with those other um, publisher companies like um, Hootsuite, which actually makes you pay for them. You actually get a free account. And believe me, we use it here at the WMA Club a lot when scheduling our posts. So we want to thank Metricool again for sponsoring today's meeting. And with that being said, I am about to send you guys over to our current meeting, which is already happens. So with that, if you guys are ready, and I know I'm ready, let's get you guys to the meeting. <laughs> And now, our feature presentation. Oh, what? You're at that something or you're good? No, no, no. It was recording. It was Hi. recording. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Another Wealth Management Advisory Club meeting. Uh, before we begin, thank you guys so much for all the love you guys gave us on our first meeting. Um, the views on YouTube actually going crazy. So thank you guys so much for that. Um, this is our first bonus meeting of the semester. So again, meetings are going to be in here, Mansion Room 13, 6 p.m. Um, but today we have Elaine King of uh, Family Money Matters. I'm just going to read a little, little bio about her, and then I'm going to let her take over from here. 
Elaine King is the founder of Family Money Matters with the mission of empowering the family, financial, and human capital to achieve financial well-being. She has served as the family financial planners for over 1,200 families and 100 multi-general family enterprises, crafting actionable fa fa family financial plans. Elaine is a financial education advocate, creator of the first family financial program in the, in the LITIM, and one of the best Latin book award. She was recognized in 2020 in the list of Investopedia's top influential advisors and in 2017 recognized by People's Magazine top 25 influential Hispanic women. Elaine has been featured in, w in Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Telemundo, and CNN as a columnist for the financial journals in the U.S. and the LATAM. So with that, guys, please have your cameras on, guys. Just please have an awesome meeting. Just ask a lot of questions. Make this engaging as possible. And with Elaine, I will let you take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it a lot. Um, I was given a, a carte blanche on what to do. So I am happy to talk about how to make a key lime pie um, today. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I want to know in the chat if that's possible, what are you studying? Uh, I know you're studying wealth management, but I want to know what you want to do with that degree. Um, because most, that, that, sorry, um, most of our student members are, you know, already different kind of finance majors, some are wealth management minors, so they all have a good range of background in um, wealth management. Oh. Private equity, okay, cool. Private equity. What else? Um, I'm looking at the chat. Okay. Private equity. What about you? Me? Accounting. Accounting? Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, anyway, I thought that, you know, you have plenty of um, guest speakers that are going to talk about wealth management, um, the state of the economy, the interest rates, asset allocation. Um, et cetera. And since this was about, you know, talk a little bit about the career. And uh, strangely enough, I started my career in Wall Street. Um, I was a manager for investment advisory service that managed $13 million. And I would um, guide financial consultants on how to do an asset allocation. But little by little, I started um, gravitating towards more um, the planning side because I thought, well, you know, I can get so much interest or, you know, return or IRR or, you know, EBITDA, whatever. <laughs> but what about the emotional side of money? Um, the volatility that the family has, the volatility that the conflicts create in a family business are immeasurable. They are not five and 7%. I mean, some of them are 100% negative. You can bring a family down, um, Actually, I mean, there have been um, relatives that kill each other because of money um, and, and companies have gone down and, and relationships have, have, um, have finished uh, because of money. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a different side. Hopefully you'll like it. Um, so first of all, you know, I, I know Jack was kind enough to say a little bit about me. Um, I have worked with uh, over 1,200 families, and if you are wondering how do I know, uh, because I was a director for um, a regional family office, and um, I was told to do an Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> and I, I actually ended up with more than that. Uh, but I, you know, those are just some of the families that I worked with. Um, I'm also an international family business advisor uh, serving on boards and I work with hundred family businesses and um, I now have more than 17,000 students in online courses for Family Money Matters. Um, so today I wanted to spend a little time on what is it, how does it identify your family? Because I mean, you could be like a PhD in private equity or in accounting, but your the emotional side of money may not be um, I guess the EQ not necessarily guarantees that it's on the top game. Um, what is the difference between women and men when managing money? And how do you nurture and measure the progress? So um, get started. So I wanna get started with um, an example of Grace and this other guy, uh, Richard. <laughs> so Grace was orphaned when she was 12. 
She never drove a car in her life. She lived in the same house. She was a secretary all her life. And uh, when she died at age 100, she left $7 million to, um, to her favorite organization. On the other hand, Richard was a president of a bank. He studied at Harvard. He was able to retire at 40 years old. He bought a house uh, for $66,000 a month of mortgage, and he ended up bankrupt and on the street these last years. So I know education is very important, but this is just... different months <laughs> that I have. Um, I grew up in like seven different countries and like 14 different cities. Um, and my parents were very young when I was born. And um, that, that played a very key role in my life um, and in my own limited beliefs of what I could accomplish, uh, be it good or bad. My dad, when I was little, he used to say that debt uh, was bad and that working for another um, was good. So um, needless to say, I have no debt and I spend a lot of my years, 20 years working for another person. Um, so you grow up with the things, I mean, out of love, of course, but that your parents tell you that, who told their parents? Their grandparents. And who told their grandparents? Their great grandparents. So it's very important to look um, and see where those limited beliefs come from in order for you to be a good financial advisor, a good private equity, a, a good CPA, a good CEO of a bank. You need to master the emotional part of money, I think. I believe that's my thoughts. And I've written eight books about it, sort of. Um, okay, so another of these observations, it's when our beliefs, actions, and values are not aligned, it becomes an emotional stress especially in finance. So 70% of the people of the population have stress and most of it is um, originated from finance. A spreadsheet may not solve this problem. Um, so how does it manifest? It manifests in anxiety. Um, I mean, you know, there's acid <laughs> that your stomach can create, um, fear of, of, of the future. Delayed decision making, you know, it takes forever to choose a major or forever to to decide. Oh, really? Who do I want to be when I grow up? Uh, insomnia, headaches. So all those things that we think are happening around us um, are very much so money related. I I believe it's my my conclusion. Um, so why? Because emotions affect your behavior with your money, and if we know this, why is it hard even for us? Because I'm assuming that I'm talking to a crowd that is pretty good with money. I mean, you guys are studying finance. You know what, you know, how to do a spreadsheet, how to get an IRR. You know, you probably are, were good at calculus. <laughs> Why is it so hard? Because it's immeasurable. Because it's unique. My... Uh, values, attitudes, and limited beliefs are not the same as Jack. Um, and it depends on the time where our parents tell, tell us. It can be measured. It's not time-specific, and it's unique. That's why it's hard. You can't really write a 
I don't know if uh, chat a AI can solve this problem because uh, chat, a I mean, the, the artificial intelligence will not know who we are. When they truly know who we are, I guess they can solve it. So anyway, so if 95% of our decisions with money are directed by the subconscious and emotions, should we aim to control or understand? Um, it's an open-ended question. It's, it's just for us to think about. Um, I think, understand because we always try to control something that we don't understand. And we have to understand it first. Um, so examples of acceptance, status, achievement, self-esteem is, you know, you see a pretty girl or something, you know, something shiny next to a material stuff, or you see Tiger Woods, you know, playing with a, with a certain type of golf club and you think, Okay, so if I get those golf clubs that are like $5,000, I think I'm going to play like Tiger Woods. Maybe you don't say it out loud, but it's just subliminal. Or I'm going to look as pretty as that woman if I buy all that jewelry. So all those things we do at, at the unconscious level. Um, again, I know that you guys study finance, but the emotional part of it is, is unspoken. So we do things at an unconscious level. We're not even conscious that we do it uh, because this comes from a long time ago. So let's start from the beginning. How do your parents, how did your parents view money? Um, positively, negatively, abundant, scarce, limiting, hard to make, easy to make. I was in a family business um, conference with 250 families and I was a keynote speaker and I asked that question to these families and I said how many of you raise your hand had parents that said that money was hard to make and almost everybody raised their hand and we have to be careful with the language that we talk because if we think that it's hard to make then it's gonna be hard to make now, I'm not saying that you have to say it's easy to make, but in a positive way, just change our narrative. Um, how did you do the first time you receive earned money? Um, I am a big advocate of allowance for children. I don't know if you guys, uh, when you were kids, I know I did <laughs> receive an allowance. Um, did I save it? Did you spend it? Did you give it away? Did you share it? Did you invest it? Did you lose it? Um, I remember I saved it. Um, there's a lot of people when I, when we had a live audience, I would ask, um, most of the people spend it because when you want something, um, you ask your dad, your mom, can I have 20 bucks for the movies? And they give you exactly $20. Um, so you really don't have, um, room to manage the money. So how are you supposed to know how to manage money if they just give you enough to spend? And then you wonder why you don't save and you don't grow it and you don't share it. And I think it should be all of this um, part. Okay, so there are a lot of connections um, with our ancestors and what are those family lessons? Um, if you wanna jump in guys, jump in, I'm looking at the chat. Um, so I did a study of about 250 families and the two that really caught my eyes, I guess, uh, were these two. Because I, I was curious to know what that connection was between how your money is today and what your parents told you. So my parents taught me that the budgets were only for low-income families, not for us, Manuela. So that lady, I mean, if you want to say in the chat or, you know, you can just think about it, um, that lady is in debt right now. Um, because her parents told her that budgets was for long-income families, so she had no budget. Um, she grew up thinking, oh, budgets are bad, budgets are bad. The second one is like, I, Diego, I learned from my dad how to prepare a budget and keep track of every penny. I learned to negotiate from my mom. Um, not to stereotype, but you know, Diego is doing pretty good uh, right now. He, he's a very successful person. Um, his parents taught him how to budget. But then again, you can't budget if you don't have more than what you need to spend. So there it is. Um, then there are some lessons that I learned too, because you know how, how, I mean, I'm not just telling you theory, I'm telling you what, what I learned from my experience. So in my case, they taught me never to stop learning, 
Your education and experience is something you can always take with you. My parents always emphasize, we're saving for your education. We're saving for education. Education is not an option. Education is a must. Follow your passion. Learn to, learn to strive to do better every day and be productive. Um, that was ingrained. I remember on the weekends when I was like in school and I thought, oh my God, sorry, I can sleep in. My dad will knock at my door at six in the morning. We were the first ones in the golf course since I was little. And I thank him because I'm a pretty good golfer. Um, well, I was. <laughs> uh, and that helps a lot um, to focus your mind. And then save. Don't spend all the money and save bread for me. Um, that's a Spanish saying. It sounds better in Spanish. But uh, what it means is that you should save before you spend, not spend and then wait to, to save money. Um, okay. And today, how are you with money? So do you feel that money is power, achievement? Do you, do you feel it's fun and abundant, health and fair, security, compassion, competition, obligation? And why I'm saying this is because there are different personalities in money. Um, you can be a really good, sorry, Mitchell, that I'm um, um, zeroing on you, but you could be like a really, you know, kick-ass private um, personality-wise, you're going to gravitate to giving. Or, um, you know, I don't know, maybe Jack is, is more of a spender. So it, it depends on, on the personality um, it's not necessarily parallel to who you want to be or what you want to become. Um, so let's see. Let's see how this plays out. So Carlos and Cata. Cata grew up in a family where money was abundant as the only child. She, she always had what she wanted. And Carlos grew up with a little money and five brothers, and it was not easy for him to get the things he wanted. So they received a $100,000 gift. And how can Carlos and Cata compromise with a decision that is fair and both for both? So what do they do with the money? Um, this is important in relationships too, how this plays out in emo the emotional side of money. When you have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, um, or any type of relationship. So in this case, um, if you want to participate, you could say, what do you think? What do you do with the money? Um, so I'm just going to rephrase. So Kata, obviously, um, she's an only child, but she always had what she wanted, and Carlos ended up with little money. So Carlos is obviously going to gravitate to save the money, and Kata is going to gravitate to um, spend the money because they grew up in different environments. Hmm. At the end of the day, um, they decided to split and compromise. But it's important. Why? Because when I've been doing conferences and I do couples conferences sometimes, um, it's very easy for somebody to blame the other person that they're um, cheap or spendthrift. It's easy to label somebody. But if we don't get curious about where those attitudes are coming from, maybe the cheap person I remember in one conference the the, woman, the the wife was blaming the husband that he was cheap and I asked him how did you grow up and he was a farmer and they just you know very limited resources it wasn't that he was cheap it's just that that's the way he grew up and the, and the woman um wasn't a millionaire but her parents had protected her so much that they didn't even see that money was so limited and she was a, definitely a giver. So for her to marry somebody that was in her mind, like very um, scarce was creating a lot of conflict. But until she understood, um, then the relationship got better. Okay, so what are some ways to uncover emotional side of money in families? You look at your grandparents' stories. Um, what about emotional side of money in families behavior during abundance and scarcity? Um, and also value they give to time versus money. Um, there is no perfect formula in my experience with 1200 families. Here are some questions that you can ask. Um, um, I mean, you can ask yourself, you can ask your family, you can ask your future clients. How does, what does money mean to you? How do you organize your money? What purpose do you have for your money? How do you leverage when you don't have it? How do you feed it? How do you grow it? 
how do you share it? Um, so those are just examples. And then things to take into consideration with the emotion is, <clears throat> back to my example of Cata and Carlos, some people are born into families that promote education and others are not. Some are born with wealth and others promote entrepreneurship and others are born during war. Um, we just have to remember to understand that success is not just hard work and that poverty is not just laziness. So we have to be careful on labeling people. Um, cost and benefit. So Buffett made $90 billion and he's like the richest man in the world working 12 hours a day, but not enough time for his family. So um, optimism and pessimism. We're programmed to prioritize pessimism. So focus on your clients about the positive relationship side of money. Um, always celebrate the wins and not hone too much on the losses. Okay, so I, okay. I have a couple more slides. So um, things to take into consideration with emotions. Understand that nobody's crazy. Or maybe understand that everybody's crazy. We all have different experiences with money. My experience and yours are different. So, you know, not, don't be easy to judge or fast to judge. Identify the habit consciously. A unique feeling is difficult to convey. Someone who lived in inflation. For example, I see the news all the time. Oh my God, inflation is 8%. The world's going to end. You know what? I was from Peru. I am from Peru. I grew up with like a thousand percent inflation. If you look at Venezuela, if you look at Argentina, I mean, it's bad. It's really bad. 8% is not a breeze, but it's not terrible. You know, um, I remember when I was little, uh, my dad um, bought me a stock and there was a crash and I lost my money to the stock market. Um, ironically enough, now I manage money. <laughs> Uh, I'm a moderate investor. Uh, I'm never going to be an aggressive investor uh, because of how I lost my allowance in the market when I was 11. Um, categorize experiences versus material things. So say yes to Australia and no to two bags. So if you, you know, uh, what I mean by that is say yes to experiences um, and, and say for the future on unique things versus buying material stuff. And I know it's hard because when we're young, we always want to buy stuff. But um, I mean, if I can give you a shortcut to this, to the game of life, um, it's more about experiences than things. Um, so anyway, um, what stocks did in your teens and twenties depends on who you talk to. Um, okay, so example. So some of the things that you should do with money and your emotions, um, put them in order because some of them are. <laughs> disorganized preferences I know if if I was in front of you live I would ask you right now I mean it's pretty late and I would give you a, an apple and a donut you probably jump to the donut it's just late we, you know we may be tired and we're just like whatever this this tastes better fast but in finances we should always aim for the apple because the apple is going to last us longer it's going to be healthier for us um it's just a long-term decision. In finance, you're, you're ahead of the game. If you make your decisions thinking long-term as opposed to short-term, that donut is probably gonna give you a high for 30 minutes and then it's gonna let you crash. And the apple is gonna just keep giving and giving and giving. <laughs> um, and finally, um, I use this example. I know um, it's a pretty basic example, but um, don't eat all the seeds plant them for the future um, because, you know, if you prioritize, if you have a hundred dollars and you don't spend a hundred, but you save the 50, um, you could, it could really reap rewards at the end of the day. Um, it's better to save a little now than a lot later. So you should start planting the seeds. You, you, you are all at an age. I, I know, I remember I started my career when I was 20 in Wall Street. And I bought my first apartment in, in Miami Beach at 24. Um, and it was because I was saving <laughs> and not spending. Maybe I wasn't like the most fashionable person with the best shoes and the best purse, but I had my apartment in South Beach uh, at 24. So it's very important to, to think long-term. Um, and there's a couple of things here you need, you know, um, EQ and FQ, financial intelligence and emotional intelligence that you need. And so it's our partner. So think about that. Um, 
these guys have um, a business, they have four children. How do they remedy the negative emotion of Diana's money in front of the grandchildren? This is a little too, too heavy for, for the audience, but um, the way to do it is to always empower the next generation with entrepreneurship. I think that's a shortcut to this one. Um, and then who needs to get involved? So I don't know if well, whoever's gonna listen to me or listen to me now has any conflict with money. I mean, that's hard for me to believe that it don't, um, but who needs to get involved? Each member who contributes or enjoys the money and the client's money needs to get involved when there's a conflict with money. Um, the best thing to do is, is communicate. If you need a facilitator or a mediator, you can always get one, uh, but don't let it get too um, deep in the problem. I'm talking parents with children. I'm talking girlfriends and boyfriends, friends. Um, it's very important to have your finances in, in good standing. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote, uh, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Um, we need to train our heart and our mind together. And money has its heart and has its emotion. So um, I am a, a lifelong student. I have a master's in, in, in family therapy, uh, postgraduate family therapy. Um, and I also have an MBA. And I think it, we need the yin and the yang. We need both sides to be good professionals in the financial industry. Um, so that's, that's what I have for you. Um, this is my cell if you need to reach me. Uh, that's my, my email. And my website is my name and my last name. It's www.elinking.com. So that's what I had prepared for you guys. And um, I want to thank Jack for setting this up. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, you have any questions for Elaine on Zoom? Anybody before I ask my question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a shy audience we have tonight. Here. I try to encourage them, you know, to ask away. No if you guys, chat, guys ask in the chat, I have no problem with you guys doing that. But I'll ask this because I usually ask this question every one of our speakers that come in because um, we do have some finance majors in our plan going down, possibly down the CFA route, but there are some who possibly want to do the CFP exam. In your opinion, and like the wealth management industry, do you feel like more people should take the CFP exam, the CFA exam, or both? Because I am an accounting major, and I have heard that, you know, taking the CPA exam is a designation for accounting major, but there's also the CMA exam. You also get double dual certified in that. You know, I'd just like to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. So if you can do both, do both. But but uh, but if you have to choose between two of them, I actually took the CFA level one because I I I have half of my career is in investing. Um, and uh, I noticed that that's not what I wanted <laughs> um, because I, I'm going to stereotype again here, but the CFA, just to prove a point, the CFA is more to be a portfolio manager. If you want to be a portfolio manager, think of, 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 uh, of the benefits that you're going to reap with that knowledge. You're going to be an analyst. Uh, you can be a portfolio manager. Uh, but they're going to pay you or benefit you for all that hard data that you're going to understand and, and learn. Now, the CFP, you become a planner, you're more client facing, and you're going to um, learn how to plan somebody's life and family. So, I, I mean, if, if I had to say a couple more things about it, CFA um, people that I know, um, that have taken it are more of the, on the introvert side and CFPs are more on the extrovert side. Like when I was in my twenties, I did not want you to put me in front of clients. I just wanted to be behind my computer and analyze all the data. Um, it wasn't until probably my mid twenties or late twenties that I was like, okay, I think I can talk to a client right now. <laughs> Because I was too nervous. I needed more knowledge. So if you're in your early 20s and you have time, then definitely do the CFA. Why not? It's never going to hurt you. Um, but if, if, if you have to choose between one or the other, then um, and you're okay with people, then the CFP will help you. Okay. And one last question for me. 
What's the best? Because we because we do have in person, we do have a couple of freshmen sophomores who actually have not determined yet what major they're going to go into business. But what would be the one piece of advice you would want to give to probably one to your younger self, and then two to a upcoming college freshman who does not know what path you know they want to go down in business? Like they don't they don't want to go down accounting or finance or you know wealth management, obviously, and W one May Club. Um, what piece of advice would you give to them? Um, so what advice would I give my younger self on what I should study and then what would I give to the rest? Okay. Um, hmm, that's a good question on my younger self. I'm going to answer the second one. It's easier. Um, so what major actually, um, I think the best thing, I mean, I'm assuming I, 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 I'm really good at math. I mean, and I'm gonna give you an example with math. It's a formula, right? So look at the, at the, <laughs> the solution is what you want to become. And the formula is the ingredients that you need to put in. Um, so for example, if I want to be, I don't know, a big shot portfolio manager, blah, blah, blah. I should start getting an internship in New York. I should really hone on my the skills that are needed in, in, I don't know, Singapore, I don't know, wherever you want to go um, and whatever you want to do. So don't, don't follow the crowd. That's one of the advices I have. But what would I tell my younger self? Holy crap. Okay. Um, I was, when I was 16, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to study because I liked everything. And uh, my dad told me that since I like everything, I mean, you told me be a doctor, be an engineer, be a dolphin trainer, I would be like, yes, yes, yes to everything. Um, my dad said, you know, whatever you're going to, um, whatever, whatever you're going to become, you're going to need to have some business background. So I would, I would just go general if you're so, I mean, if somebody's so confused and just go general and then you could always master in something specific. But if we want to be a business owner, I, I mean, I, I, I guess this is a, a good advice for the future. Um, there are going to be big companies, but there are going to be limited jobs and the people are going to live a hundred and plus years. So you better off taking some entrepreneurship courses because at the end of the day, you're going to need to have your own business. Um, and definitely add a little bit of computer science and artificial intelligence to that because, I mean, it's, it's happening. So you should definitely own them on that. I hope, I hope I answered your question. No, you answered my question right to the point. Um, does anyone else on Zoom have any questions? Mitchell, Amanda, Kevin, you guys can put it in the chat if you guys want. I'll read it. I have no problem doing that, but... <laughs> Put you guys on the spot here. <laughs> so, so what made you transition? You probably said, uh, "What made you transition from like the Wall Street stuff to uh, just family stuff in general?" Was it just because um you want to learn more about the emotional side of money, or was there something else to it? Um. Yeah. So that's a good question. So, I was um. I was the investment side of things in headquarters in New York and in Miami. And I saw that there were limited amount of jobs as in the headquarters area. Um, there were more opportunities client facing and a lot of people, a lot of recruiters told me, Lane, um, client facing is like your own business. And you, if you know, the, the businesses that I work with got restructured. So, they got sold and bought and merged and there was a lot of restructuring. So for me to be a little more constant on what I wanted to build, I needed to take the leap and be client facing. Um, and to be client facing, that meant to be more dealing with people and to be unique. It was, I, I learned um, that families was very, were very important. It was just not your money. Um, personally, but it was who did you come with uh, to the bank with or um, who influences your decision making. 
So for me, I was so curious. It was, I was fascinated by that part more than why did the portfolio return, um, you know, with a risk of five on 8%, like that I could probably solve. And it's a limited, it, I mean, a lot of my, the people around me start saying that um, managing money was a commodity and it was becoming more and more of a commodity. So that resonated in my brain. And I said, well, what's not a commodity? Not a commodity is the personal experience you can give to a person um, or a family. And if you can um, improve the relationship of a family finances, I think they will be forever grateful as opposed to if you can get them, um, I don't know, 2% more of the market. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just generalizing here, but this is my conclusion, my observance and my personal um, experience. Does that make sense, Mitchell, or I don't know if I answered. Uh, yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Anyone on Zoom? Anyone here in person? Kevin, Manda, last chance. Once, twice, thrice. Oh, all right, Kevin's the question. Um, would, I'm sorry, what would you rank higher as a young professional lifestyle or compensation? How do you, how do you, what would you, what would I rank higher as a yeah. young professional? Lifestyle or compensation? Oh, so if I'm looking for a job, like if they give me more lifestyle than, than money? Yes. Okay, so when I was 20 years old, I moved into Manhattan working in Wall Street and I slept in a mattress in a... <laughs> Of course, in a very nice, you know, uh, doorman uh, apartment, but um, I definitely did not choose lifestyle, but I didn't really choose compensation either. I think I chose career because I knew that if I had a good resume, um, I can give more in the future. It was an investment for me. So I, uh, I would say, I don't know, neither. I mean, I didn't choose lifestyle or compensation. Um, I wouldn't choose either, I guess. I mean, if that's maybe lifestyle. Okay. Because yeah, being in Manhattan, I guess is considered to be in a, a lifestyle, but, but don't think of me in a limo, you know, in the, in the, in the penthouse or anything like that. No, I was, I just moved in with my golf clubs and, and a mattress, uh, that the ex-tenant had left for me. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's how I got started. So, um, yeah, the lifestyle is going to give you more options to grow um, Then definitely anything that gives you more experience for the future, I would choose. Is that, is that what you meant, Kevin? Okay, good. Yeah, and, and, and to give you another example, now that I've been around the block for a while, um, I, I get sometimes offers of compensation and I definitely choose lifestyle over compensation. Like today, definitely. My, my, uh, my time is, is much more important and precious to me than compensation. <laughs> All right, any last minute questions for Elaine? Going once, twice, twice, sold. So with that, uh, thank you so much, Elaine, for coming in um, on such you know late notice, coming in here late at night just to speak to us. We really appreciate <laughs> you being here. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, E-board members and WMA club members, please stay behind. We have a couple of announcements to make. And uh, yeah, Elaine, thank you so much for coming and speak to us. No problem. Any questions you have, just follow up via LinkedIn or my website. I'm happy to help. Well, thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.